morning, everyone. Good morning. Wow, so many people. It's great to see so many people out. Um, just something I wanted to um, read, Emma. And I thought about this when I, I jotted it down after last week's service. And I thought how about Patty gets up here and she just takes over and she says, I had something on my heart and I'm just going to share it. So <laughs> I thought, I want to do that. <laughs> so, and, and I was just thinking about um, last week's service and um, how Jason had said to us um, that Mr. Waterhouse had inspired him. So, and I was thinking about um, Mr. Hughes and Mr. Waterhouse and, um, and how blessed we are to have um, had two um, great leaders here at the chapel. So I thought, if we had um, asked um, all the men to, um, that had been inspired by the, both those two men um, to speak since we um, don't have, um, so it's, we have been having guest speakers. And if we just asked them to speak once, we'd have guest speakers for years. Mm -hmm. So it just uh, amazes me. Thank you, it's great to be here. Let us just uh, open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, what a glorious and beautiful day it is. It's good to be in the house of the Lord with all the dear folks here, Lord. And dear Heavenly Father, there are many requests on our hearts and minds. I know there's celebrations of great events that we've just said and mentioned. And uh, yet there are those uh, prayer requests that are in our hearts, Lord, and in our minds that each one carries. And Lord, we lift them up to you. We lift each one up to you here. We pray that uh, as we sing uh, hymns and songs to you in glory and honor, for your glory and honor, and as we look into your word later, we just pray that it will be all said and done, that, that we can glorify your name, that we can be witnesses for your grace and mercy, and we thank you again for each one here committing this time into your hands. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our precious Savior, amen. amen. Thank you. There were goodly trees in the springling sod, trees of beauty, height, and grace to stand in splendor before his face. Apple and hickory, ash and pear, oak and beech and tulip rare, the trembling aspen, the noble pine, the sweeping elm by the river line, the trees for the birds to build and sing, and the lilac, no, the lilac trees for the joy in spring. Trees to turn up at the frosty call and carpet the ground for the Lord's footfall. Trees for fruitage and fire and shade, trees for the cunning builder's trade. Wood for the bow, the spear and the flail, the keel and the mast of the daring sail. He made them for every grain and girth, for, for the use of man in the garden of earth. Then, lest the soul should not lift her eyes from the gift of the giver of paradise. Okay, I think I can do this. <laughs> on, the crown of, on the crown of a hill, which every, wait, what was it again? On the crown of a hill for all to see was a scarlet maple tree. His eyes on the sparrow. Many years ago, there was a little girl named Edna. Edna lived in England, and she was a very happy child who smiled a lot. 
She didn't know it, but her life was about to change dramatically and head in a different direction. Edna's parents decided to go with her mother's twin brother and most of her extended family to start a new life in Canada. They packed up all of their belongings, said goodbye to their families, and started out on their new adventure of a lifetime. After arriving in Canada, Edna's family settled in Montreal. Her dad got a job working for the railroad. Her mother's family settled in a farming community in Ontario. There were a day's journey away by train, but Edna's father could get tickets for free. They loved their new country and made friends quickly. They became good friends with the neighbors on their street. After a couple of years, Edna's parents also had another baby, a little sister for Edna. Her name was Norma. Edna loved Norma very much and kissed her and played with her whenever she could. A storm came into Edna's beautiful life. Her mother's twin brother died in a tragic accident on his farm in Ontario. Edna's mother was devastated. Her parents decided that she was not ready to handle a funeral. They asked the dear next door neighbor if Edna could stay with her while they were traveling to the funeral. They asked the neighbors not to send Edna to school until they returned. After teary farewells, they set out on their journey to Ontario, taking baby Norma with them. The storm was about to get bigger. Edna's parents had been away for two weeks and were due to return in Montreal that day. She was so excited to see them and to see her baby sister. Her neighbor told her that since her parents would be home today, she could go to school. Edna was glad to go to school as it made time pass more quickly. Meanwhile, as her parents' train chugged across the miles, a huge and unexpected snowstorm began to make the train's passage difficult. Eventually, the train was forced to stop and wait until the track was cleared to continue. Edna's parents were anxious to see their daughter. Back in Montreal, Edna was just as anxious to see her parents as her parents were to see her. She was finding it difficult to focus on her schoolwork and was fidgeting a lot. Suddenly, she stopped moving and furrowed her brow. There was a strange smell in the classroom. She realized and, and relaxed, realizing it was just smoke from the wood stove in the corner. Then she smelled it again. It was getting stronger. Edna glanced at the wood stove. It didn't appear to be smoking. Just then, Edna heard someone on the floor below them shout, Fire! Fire! Get out! The school's on fire! The children all started to scream and run in panic. Edna's teacher ran out of the room and the kindergarten students tried to follow her, but their way down the stairs to the exit was blocked by smoke and fire. The wooden schoolhouse was quickly glowing up in flames. Edna went to the window and tried to open it. Her little fingers just would not work. She couldn't get the window open. It would not budge. She could see the firefighters outside and see a man climbing up the ladder, but she could not get out. Time seemed to stand still. In that moment, Edna saw a little sparrow flitting through the air outside of the window. She remembered the verse her mother had whispered in her ear as she kissed her goodbye before leaving for the funeral. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one well of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not. Therefore, you are more of more value than many sparrows. Help me, Father, Edna cried, and at that very moment, a pair of arms reached around her and opened the window. Edna looked up to see the determined and soot smudged face of her principal, who had fought her way back through the flames and smoke to get the kindergarten children out of their top floor classroom. The principal began passing children out of the window and to the waiting firemen below. Edna herded the rest of the panicked children towards the window. The smoke was thick and it was difficult to breathe, but Miss Maxwell, the principal, was still passing out children out of the window, so she struggled on too. Edna's mother was destined to have her heart broken for the second time in two weeks. Miss Maxwell, Edna, and 15 other ch children succumbed to the smoke and passed into eternity on that cold, fiery winter day. But God saw them fall, and because of their falling, laws were put in place about how to build Canadian elementary schools so that no more tiny lives will be lost in a fire. Edna's family moved into the country, close to their relatives, and every time her mother saw a sparrow, 
Edna's mother remembered her fallen sparrow, and and the birds reminded reminded her of Edna and that God sees. She taught her remaining daughter Norma to love the birds, and that reminded her of Edna. That and Norma taught her granddaughter to love the sparrows. That and re, that reminded her that God sees. And her granddaughter, my mom, is teaching me to, to do the same. <laughs> Uh, so, how many of you know your ABCs? <laughs> Yay. Yay. <laughs> so, uh, many people don't know their ABCs of salvation. Um, so, here they are. Um, first, A, which stands for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Now, th this block is green, and in nature, when something is green, it usually means it's alive and growing. But when sin grows in the heart, it produces death. Now, the second block is B which stands for Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Behold is just an old word that means, look, here is something great. And that block is red, which stands for the blood that Jesus shed on the cross to pay for our sins. And finally, C stands for Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. That block is yellow. And in olden days, if a person was a coward, they might paint a yellow streak along their back. It seems to that many people are afraid, afraid to put all their hope in Jesus and nothing else. I'd like to use this hat to represent heaven, just an empty hat, and I will, and I will place all the ABCs one by one into the hat. Now, the plan of salvation did not begin on earth, but was in God's heart a million billion years ago. God did not look down on a fleecy cloud one day and discover to his shock that man had sinned. He knew many years before he created Adam that man would sin and that the price of bringing him back to God would be the life of his own son. The Bible describes Jesus as a lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. The obvious we is just this spindle here, and I'd like it to represent the earth, even though it doesn't look much like the earth. Although they once thought the earth was flat, like the base of the spindle. Do any of you know um, who first discovered that the Earth was round? Okay, Aurora. Christopher Columbus. That's right, Christopher Columbus. Uh, there was once a teacher who was um, testing her students to see if they remembered her lesson on Columbus, and she asked one boy, uh, Johnny, is the Earth flat? To which he replied, no, ma'am. This pleased the teacher, but she decided to test him further, so she asked him, Johnny, is the Earth square? To which he replied, no, ma'am. So then she asked him, Johnny, is the Earth round? Yeah. And he replied, no, ma'am. So, so, she, so she said, well, Johnny, if the earth isn't flat, and it isn't square, and it isn't round, then what is the earth like? And he replied, well, I don't know exactly, but my dad says it's real crooked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that boy's dad is right. The world is crooked. One of the words for sin in the Bible, iniquity, means to go crooked, to go off the straight path. Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray, each of us turning to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquities of us all. That's why Jesus had to come down to earth. So they should not come to earth as a piece of paper, but as a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. That brings me back to the hat. So I would like to take all these pieces, all of these blocks from the hat, which represented heaven, down to the earth with the spindle, which represent how Jesus came down from heaven to earth. First, the first block, C, call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Then B, behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And finally, the last block, A, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Now, when Jesus came to earth, people didn't receive him as their king. Instead, they sentenced him to death on a cross. Then, they put him in a grave or a tomb and sealed the entrance with a massive stone. I'd like this casing here to represent the tomb he was sealed in. I'd like to place it over all three of the blocks to represent how Jesus was sealed in the tomb. But does anyone know what happened to Jesus after three days in the tomb? 
He was he resurrected. Was, is he? He rose again. That's right, he rose again. And if that's true, then one of the blocks should be missing. If you remember which block represented Jesus, that was the B block. As you can see, if we lift the casing, we have the C block and the A block. No B block. So, so you might, some of you might have thought that I was hiding the B block in this casing, and that's what they thought when they first discovered Jesus's body was missing from the tomb. They thought he had just been moved to a different area of the tomb. But Jesus is in no tomb. There's only one place where Jesus can be. And do any of you know where that is? Heaven. Uh -huh. Heaven. That's right, heaven. <laughs> and which one of the rocks that's represented heaven? <laughs> So thank you for inviting us back. Uh, the kids are up for a week at camp, and so they're very much looking forward to that. They're all keyed up. Uh, Draft Lake's running one-week sessions this year, and they're getting back into it. Our youngest there, she was all keen to start Draft Lake last year, and then it kind of blew up on her, and so she is real thrilled uh, to be able to have her first week this year. And it's always a great thing to be back home and to see all you, and I see so many faces. Uh, they just remind me of so much, and. Um, it's a wonderful feeling to be here. Uh, this morning we're going to talk a little bit about um, a subject that I think touches us all. Uh, sorry? The oh, sorry. We're sorry. going to do this yeah. first. Yeah, and mess this all together. So we're going to we're, we're going to have a reading. Good call. <laughs> I, I forgot the instructions okay. I was given. We're we're going to have a reading. We're going to read together. I'm going to read the white part. You're going to read the yellow part. And then when we're through with that, uh, we'll send the youngers down, uh, downstairs. So Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the Lord came in to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One day I have desired of the Lord, that I must seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me, he shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. And the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his word. Lord Jesus, we thank you for uh, this opportunity to come to your word this morning. Uh, we thank you that uh, you have comfort and encouragement for us there. You have guidance and wisdom, uh, everything we need. Uh, to live this life and to live it in a way that would honor you, we can find it in your word. And we just pray that you would uh, help us today to, to um, connect with what we hear, that your spirit would work in our lives and our hearts to uh, change us into the people you want us to be. And we pray for the kids as they head off to their classes that you'll uh, do the same for them, and that they'll hear your voice early. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be looking at a little story from the Old Testament this morning. Uh, those of you uh, who know your Bible well will probably be familiar with it, but if you aren't, that's okay. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to summarize the story that happens before. I'm not going to read all the way through it because we've been reading for a long time and there isn't time. But I'm going to read this section and then we'll talk about the events that kind of led up to it and um, you know, we'll see the theme that we find uh, you know, in, in this bit of scripture. So. We're in 1 Kings, and it's chapter 19, and in my Bible it's titled, Elijah Flees Jezebel. So, starting in chapter 19, 1 Kings, verse 1, it says, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. We'll talk about what Elijah had done here in a minute. And how he killed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, so may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as one of them by this time tomorrow. And then he, that's Elijah, was afraid. He arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, 
and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came down and sat under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under the broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked in hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came in a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. Then he came to a cave and he lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I even only, and I only, I am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountain and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I even only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you will anoint Hazael, Hazael to be the king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be the king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Meloah, you shall anoint the prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. The one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. We're going to leave it off uh, there for this morning. So uh, this, is, this is an interesting story. It's kind of hard for us to really get our uh, minds around all the names and the places and that kind of thing. But I'm going to just take what happens in chapter 18, and I'm going to summarize that for you. And it will help you kind of connect the dots to what's going on in this chapter, hopefully. And then, and then we'll talk about some of the things that kind of come out in the experience of the prophet, um, you know, as the Lord takes him away out of danger and uh, he's in solitude for a while. So in chapter 18, uh, a little bit of backstory, Ahab, uh, this king of Israel, he's not a nice fellow uh, and he's easily led astray just like his fathers before him. He's born into this tribe of Om Omri, basically the crown has been in their hands for a while. And uh, so he is the king, and he uh, marries this woman named Jezebel, who is a foreign princess. And, uh, you know, your mind can kind of go back to the early kings of Israel. You know, they got caught up in this kind of thing, too, and it didn't work out for Solomon and, and these others. Well, Ahab, it's the same. He's imported his wife from a place called Tyre, which is just up the coast of, um, of the uh, Mediterranean. And she lives in what is now modern-day Lebanon. And the group of people who uh, lived there, they were called Phoenicians. They were, uh, basically, the Phoenicians lived all around the Mediterranean Rim. They, lived, they had a big capital called Carthage, got involved with Rome later, but that's not really important for today's story. And uh, the Phoenicians, they worshipped a god named Baal. And there were actually uh, many different Baals that were worshipped in that area, the Canaanites. They had Baal this and Baal that. But they all had their roots basically in the same form of worship. And there were a couple of things that kind of earmarked Baal worship. Okay, so there was this idea of fertility. They're often called fertility cults uh, in Canaan because the idea was that if you pleased Baal enough, you got good crops, right? And crops meant you could eat. But back then, the whole economy was basically uh, built around food. Um, and then there were some overtones that were uh, sort of adult themes, unfortunately. So, you know, they worship Baal's wife, Astarte, or, or there was a few different names for her. 
Uh, and the idea was that through this sort of ritual sexual practice in their temples, you could encourage the gods to procreate and bring more fertility to the land. So they had, they had this going on, and God wanted none of that for his people. But they also had this really nasty habit of uh, sacrificing their children to encourage fertility, okay? And, and so God had no use for that, of course, and he wanted it just eradicated. And um, so these, these people, they would often um, take their firstborn, and they would uh, kill their firstborn, and the idea was that then subsequently they would have all these other wonderful blessings from their god Baal. It's kind of a horrible practice. And um, actually, if you go back to chapter 16, uh, not to give you nightmares or anything, but it talks, it talks about this man who was to rebuild Jericho, which, you know, God had said, never rebuild that city or you'll be cursed. And this man, this man says, well, I'm going to rebuild it. And Ahab says, go ahead and do it. Uh, his name is Heel of Bethel. And uh, to make sure that his work is successful, he kills his firstborn, uh, buries him at the gate, and then kills, his, or like on the foundation of the work, and then kills his youngest, and buries him on the on the completion of the work, right? In order to thank you know Baal for uh, helping him rebuild the city. So this is this is the kind of culture basically that um, that Elijah is encountering, and the people of Israel have kind of gone after this. You've got to remember, like the people of Israel, they had Yahweh, uh, the God, the one true God, that they had uh, had bring them out of Egypt and into the Promised Land. But when they got to the promised land, a lot of them started to kind of wonder whether, you know, Yahweh was effective in this land. That was the thinking, right? Okay, so, you know, we've left Egypt behind in the wilderness. God worked out for us in the desert with the manna and the, you know, the quail and all that stuff, right? The water into the rock. But now we're in Canaan, and maybe if we want to be prosperous in Canaan, like all those Canaanites were, we should, you know, please the local gods. That's the, that was the idea. And so you had this continual, you know, siphoning away of people into Baal worship, God's uh, own people. And Elijah is standing against all this and saying, stop, you know, uh, return, return to the God of Israel. And, and Ahab has followed his wife into Baal worship and not just followed her, but like massacred the priests, like the, the ones that remained faithful to Yahweh, uh, torn down altars to Yahweh and built shrines to Baal in their place. So this is, this is the circumstances that Elijah finds himself in. So Elijah puts out this challenge, okay, uh, to the prophets of Baal. He says, let's get real here for a second, okay? If, if Baal is the real thing and all this stuff is necessary in order for you to have great crops, then let's go up to the top of this mountain. We're both going to make a sacrifice, okay, but we're not going to bring fire. You can bring everything else, but you're not going to bring fire. And, you know, I'll call on my God. Yahweh, you call on your God, Baal, and we'll see who can bring fire from heaven, basically. And a lot of us remember this story from Sunday school. Uh, so, you know, Elijah takes it three steps further. He says, you know, build a moat and douse the sacrifice in water. And, you know, he goes, he goes above and beyond to basically demonstrate uh, that, he, it, that, that Yahweh is the real deal and that Baal is just nothing, right? And what ends up happening is... You know, God sends fire from heaven, consumes Elijah's sacrifice. The people of Israel who are present recognize that the prophets of Baal are frauds in this moment. And Elijah says, okay, chase those guys down and do them all in. There's like 450 of them, right? And lest you feel particularly sympathetic for the prophets of Baal, bear in mind these guys are baby killers, right? Like that's basically their pastime. So, uh, you know, I don't think Elijah was losing any sleep really about uh, having, having them... Uh, taken out. And so the, the people of Israel chase them down and they bury these guys uh, by a spring called Kishon. And uh, word gets back to Jezebel. Bear in mind the prophets of Baal, they're, she probably brought a lot of them with her or imported them or whatever. They're her friends, colleagues, and everything else in her form of religion. And she is incensed. Okay, this woman's basically enraged. So she, she basically, um, she, that's how her chapter starts out. It says that uh, Ahab told Jezebel, that's her husband, he comes in to his wife and says, says, Elijah's just killed all your prophets of Baal, right? And Jezebel sends a messenger back to Elijah. It's interesting she sends a messenger. You'd think she would send an assassin, right? Uh -huh. but she, sends, she sends a message to him. I think she just wanted him to, you know, experience fear, right? She says, 
So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as one of them by this time tomorrow. In other words, uh, I'm willing to risk my life to bail if, if I don't have you put out by, you know, the time 24 hours go by. And Elijah knows what this woman is capable of, and he's terrified. He runs off into the wilderness, lays down under the broom tree, and that's where we find him, basically, in this story. But we're going to come back to that in a minute, okay? I, I've just given you some of the historical detail, but I want to kind of connect this with our lives today because, uh, you know, a lot of times when we go into the Old Testament, we find some really interesting history, but then we wonder, you know, what is it, what is there in here for me? You know, who are the prophets of Baal? So where, where, how does this align with my life, right? And I'm just going to tell you an experience, I, and I want you to think about your own life, and I want you to think maybe back, and you might not have to think very far, you might have to think a long ways back. But I want, to think, I want you to think of your own circumstances and see if you can relate to a couple stories I'm going to tell you. Okay? So I remember when I was younger, I was maybe um, 18, well not, not even, I would have been 15 or 16, I would have been in high school. And there was a youth retreat that was uh, going on in Halliburton, I can't even remember what camp it was at, it was at one of the camps over there. And it was this big event, went for three days, very exciting, met a lot of people, uh, it's very um, I, I don't know, nurturing to the soul, uh, you get it socially when you're that age, you really want to plug into people, connect with people, make friends. And uh, this thing finished up on Sunday afternoon, and for whatever reason I can't remember, but um, Dad couldn't get out to get me until like later on that evening, basically, because he had other things he had to do. Uh, and he did come to get me, but in the intervening time, I was at the camp basically you know, just wandering around by myself for about four hours, uh, you know, just, uh, and, and I remember this overwhelming, crushing sense, almost kind of a depression just descended on me, because you're in this place, right, that, that has all this memory that you've just built in it and connected with other people, but you're there alone, right, so you're not really experiencing it in that way anymore, uh, and some of you can maybe relate. Um, I can think of another uh, similar circumstance. I was, I was called once, uh, this was after, long after I left home and was done with Bible college. Um, the, the camp, Graphite, uh, asked me, can you come and fix your computer? This was back in the days when, you know, you had to do all that locally and it was, you know, hard drives would blow up and all this boring stuff. So, so they called me, can you fix your computer? So, so I said, yeah, no problem. It was like February, it was the middle of the year. Uh, so I, I drove up, um, I drove up through a snowstorm got in and it's just like, it's just a whiteout basically. I get into the camp, there's nobody there except for uh, Patty Robinson, bless her soul, and she said, oh, I'm really sorry to bother you, but we're getting tax receipts out and all our information is on that computer and if we lose it, I have no idea what we'll do for accounting, right? So, no pressure. So, 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 so I, I, I kicked off um, this utility that's supposed to try to recover bad hard drive sectors. Back in the old day, you did that. You don't do that anymore, you use backup. But anyway, um, it, it's grinding through. This process is like a three or four hour process, okay? So again, I'm, I'm stuck at the camp, I'm by myself, and Graphite is a very interesting place for me because I went there as a child until I was into my teen years. I went back, um, I went back basically uh, to um, retreats for Bible college and then for stuff around that in a whole different context. And then I went to weddings there too. So, so I had I had interacted with that place in a lot of different ways with a lot of different people. But of course, none of them were there, and I was sitting there watching the snow come down for four hours, basically. And I had the exact same kind of feeling, you know, just this, um, I don't know, depression of being alone and being disconnected from all those people. Um, and so, uh, when we get to Elijah in our story here. Um, you know, he, he experiences something very similar to this, right? Uh, he's, he's, he's basically, uh, you know, he, he has all these people that he was connected to, fellow prophets and what have you, people who had been serving Yahweh in Israel. Jezebel has killed most of them as far as he's aware, right? So they've all been just taken out. Some of them were hid, we're told, by, one of, by his friend Obadiah uh, in a cave. Um, but most of them are exterminated, okay? So he's feeling very, very much like he's the last guy, and now Jezebel is basically coming for him, okay? So, so, that's, so that's one kind of aloneness. He's alone because there's nobody else with him, right? But then uh, Elijah is also feeling alone 
be, because he is in a sense alone in his principles. That's, that's how he feels. He's, he's alone in terms of his perspective, his worldview. And that happens to us a lot too, right? Uh, you can feel alone even in a room full of people if you can't relate to those people in some way. And, um, you know, so, uh, sometimes, I, I think for believers, we feel that way in the world a lot of the time. You know, we look around us, we see, you know, the number of people who are committed or determined, um, you know, who seem to really be uh, tracking with the Word of God. We see those numbers sometimes diminish in local contexts, and we say to ourselves, you know, what's happening here? Are we the last, are we it? Are we the only ones doing this anymore? And that's, and that's very much the way Elijah feels, uh, you know, in this story. He feels like I'm, I'm the last guy, uh, you know, for whom this matters. And, and so uh, God speaks to Elijah uh, in this particular situation. Uh, he, he, actually, God does three things, and we're going to look at all of them. And God really does these same things for us where we find our loneliness, whether that's, that's loneliness because we're by ourselves or whether it's loneliness because we have trouble relating. Uh, either way, uh, God does these three things uh, for us. So God, first of all, provides in our loneliness. If we go to verse 5, we see that it says, He lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake, baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. And then if we, if we go down to verse 9, it says, He came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. God provides him food to eat, water to drink, shelter, even in this barren wilderness. Uh, it's nothing, I mean, you can't grow grain in the desert. Uh, he's, he's been driven out. He can't go back. There's nothing to eat, right? And in that moment of aloneness, being by himself, God provides for his needs, even uh, you know the rudimentary needs they are. We find out if we if we look really closely that uh, the angel asks him to eat twice, and the reason the angel asks him to eat twice is because he goes on a forty-day journey uh, from that first moment to where he gets to Mount Horeb. Hor Mount Horeb, by the way, is the place that the Ten Commandments were given. So he's going back to he's going back to the place where Moses gave the law. It's way down in the Sinai Peninsula, and uh, he's just. He's basically on a 40-day journey through the wilderness. God is looking after him the whole way, basically, providing for his need. Uh, and when we are faced with a situation like that, where we feel alone, uh, for whatever respect, or we feel, we feel that even maybe just in terms of the way we see the world, or the way that we uh, are trying to serve the Lord that we're alone, um, God provides for our needs too. Uh, and he provides for us even, you know, as a church, he provides... Uh, in all of these different ways with the things that are necessary, basically. And then we see also that God speaks in our loneliness. So if we look at verse 9, uh, He came to a cave, He lodged in it, and the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, the Lord says to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Right? I, w I wonder you know, if we kind of hear that sometimes in our own heads, you know, based on what we're doing or where we are, you know, God comes to us and says, you know, what are you doing here? You know, uh, and Elijah is really, um, understandably, having a little bit of self-pity, so a lot of self-doubt, basically says, I've done all I can, nobody's listening to me, uh, this woman wants me dead, everything is bad, just kill me. That's, bas that's, basically, <laughs> that's basically what he says to God. You know, I've run my course, I've done everything you could want from me, uh, you know, just finish me off. And... And God says, what are you doing here, Elijah? He speaks to him in his loneliness. And then Elijah responds, uh, he responds twice actually, and he says the exact same thing. When I was first reading through this chapter, uh, just preparing, I thought I was seeing double for a second, you know, that maybe they printed twice, because he gives the exact same speech, right? Uh, so in verse, in verse uh, 10, he says, uh, I have been very jealous for the Lord. That means, you know, I just wrung out, done everything I can. For the God of hosts, for the people of Israel, I have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your, for, no, for the people of Israel, have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. He says the exact same thing in verse 14. Uh, and he repeats himself. Uh, clearly, um, 
for Elijah, he feels like this is the end of his ministry. And, uh, you know, he kind of intimates that in his conversation with God. And then God responds to him, right? Um, we see that uh, God is going to speak to him in verse 15, and he's going to tell him what the next steps are. Okay? But we're, we're going to focus in on verse 18, because God reminds him of something. Okay? And this is the third thing that God does in our loneliness. So God provides in our loneliness. He gives us the things that we need. Uh, you know, to, to get through the circumstances that we're in. God speaks to us in our loneliness. Uh, in this case, he said, Elijah, what are you doing? <laughs> and then God reminds us of things in our loneliness. And in verse 18, he says, I will yet leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. In other words, what he's telling Elijah is, you are not alone, right? And and even in that moment, well, you know, Elijah looks around him, he's in the wilderness, he feels like everybody's against him, and now they're hunting him down. God is saying, I know everybody who's still out there, right? And this is the thing about an omnipotent God, right? He knows every heart that's left that hasn't, when he says kissed Baal, he means embrace Baal worship, basically. Uh, he, says, he says, there's still 7,000 people in Israel who I'm going to call, uh, you know, to fidelity, and um, those knees have not bowed, you are not alone. That's basically what he's communicating. He reminds um, Elijah of this. And these three things together, they lift us out of the despair that comes from loneliness. Uh, that God provides, that God speaks, that God reminds us. You know, when I, when I think about this place, I, I've had that feeling here before. I've, I've come up to the chapel a few times uh, over the years, and I... Hopefully I won't, uh, <laughs> I should stop moving. Uh, I've, I've come up to the chapel a few times over the years when there's been nobody here, uh, just to pick something up or drop something off or that kind of thing, and just wander through the place. And every time I, I look at, you know, a classroom or I see, you know, the spots back here where we used to hold props or whatever else, you know, there's just a rush of memory that comes back. I'm sure that's true for a lot of you who, who've been here for, Time. You can just think your way through, you know, miles of memories, uh, you know, that are connected with it. And then, and then I think of the people, you know, I think of people like Don and Dad and Sam and Harold and Ken Sanderson, Paul Way, uh, you know, these guys who were really, you know, spiritual fathers to me, Jake, who's thankfully still with us. And, and I, th I think to myself, man, like uh, all these people gone on to glory and I have that same Feeling, you know, sometimes I think I think to myself, you know, are we all are we all alone here? You know, you get this you get this um, thought process going on in your mind where, you know, there was there was this time where you had all this energy and all these people and and um, wonderful servants of the Lord who were you know committed to His way. How can we keep going? And and that's the, that's the thought you know in our hearts. I don't I don't mean as a church. I mean personally. Yes. You know, how how do we keep going uh, spiritually when you feel that you're sort of spiritually bereaved like that? And it's, and it's these same things, right? Where God, God's, God comes to us and he provides uh, for our needs, whatever those may be, and he will do the same thing. Uh, here, God speaks to us, right? So we hear the voice of God and we hear him through his word, right? Uh, God speaks to us as often as we care to hear if we're willing to you know, open his word and listen. And then, and then God reminds us, you know, this comes through the speaking. He reminds us, you know, we read the promises of God um, and, and we realize that we are not alone. There, we have brothers and sisters all the way across the globe. People at this very moment are, who, who have not bowed their knee to whatever gods, you know, that we have, our materialism or secular humanism or whatever it may be, right? We have, we have many who have not bowed their knee uh, to those things either, who are worshiping in the same way right now right? Uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we can be reminded of that fact. That God is still building his church. Uh, we're, we're a tiny piece of that, and we may feel insignificant, but no piece is insignificant. And as we, as we serve the Lord, he will provide, he'll speak, he'll remind us, uh, even when we feel the crushingness of um, loneliness. So those were the thoughts that I pulled out of chapter 19 for today. Um, great story. I encourage you to go back and just read the surrounding detail. Uh, you'll find it fascinating, but uh, let's just take a moment and we'll thank, Earth, thank the Lord for our time together this morning. Lord Jesus, we uh, 
come before you, we recognize that you are the author of all things, and you're the author of history. And even the bits of uh, history that we've read today, but the, but the history that's relevant to our immediate context, our own lives, uh, you have brought us to the point we are today. You know who we are intimately. You know all the things that we struggle with. Uh, you know our worries, our frustrations. Um, we look here at, a, at, at your servant Elijah. We see him in the desert basically um, just wanting to die. You felt like there was nothing left for him to live for. And um, we know that you can come to us even when we're in the depths of despair, whatever it may be uh, that we feel has been taken away or isn't the same anymore. Um, we know that you can give us reinvigorated purpose. And you do that as you provide for our needs, as you speak to us, and as you remind us that we're uh, not on our own. And uh, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, who is always with us, uh, no matter who may be around us, um, the, the Comforter. And we thank you that um, at the end of the day, we will be with you and be with you eternally. We'll never be alone. Um, and we just look forward to that day. We pray that you'd part us with blessing and, and with these thoughts. In Jesus' name, 